So today, uh, this is the final day of the series uh, titled Built for Battle. And today's title is The Lance of Prayer and Supplication. Uh, up until this point, we've already covered the loin belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And so uh, if you've missed any of those or all of those, the good news is you can go back on the internet and you can watch each one of those and I would highly recommend that you do that. So now we come to the last piece of weaponry that Paul listed in Ephesians chapter six, verse 18. And I'm sure you're tired, so you probably can't stand for the reading of the word of God. <laughs> Shame on you, that's what I figured. All right. Oh, Billy, I can always count on you for a laugh, man. Ha, <laughs> I like it, I like it. Ephesians chapter six, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer. Let me stop right there. Praying always with prayer. He says, Paul says, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, God, that through these last several weeks, God, that you have given us such great revelations wisdom, understanding. Father, as we come to the conclusion of this series, I pray, God, that when we leave today, that each individual will be dressed for battle, ready for victory. Help me today, God. Strengthen me. Give me wisdom. Open my mouth when it needs to be opened, but close it when it needs to be closed, God. I pray that no distractions would take place in anyone's mind that we could focus on what you are speaking to us in Jesus' name and amen. You may be seated. Most commentaries agree that the Roman soldier had seven pieces of weaponry in his armor suit. They all said that that, that I read and, and, and a book that I've studied out of said that Paul's list of armor was incomplete, stopping short of mentioning the last weapon. But the last weapon is the Roman soldier's lance. A lance is a spear, you can see it there. Although the lance is not specifically mentioned by name in these verses, it has to be in the text to be complete. And just this morning, it dropped in my spirit, it mentioned six weapons, but there had to be seven. And seven is what in the Bible? Completeness. So, it's found in Ephesians 6 and 18, where we've been studying Ephesians 6, 14 through 17. So if we don't stop at 17 and we continue into 18, we'll find the answer. So the last weapon is the lance of prayer and supplication. There is the supernatural provision of the Christian soldier that is ready to go to battle and that supernatural provision is prayer. A constant spirit of prayer. The soldier enters into the conflict fully dressed uh, and armed, uh, but something else is essential. You've got to have confidence, you've got to have assurance, and you've got to have courage. How do you get courage? How do you get assurance? How do you get confidence? It comes from a spirit of prayer. So I ask you individually, how is your confidence today? How is your courage? 
There has been a couple times in ministry that the enemy came and attacked me and I allowed him to take my confidence. He took it for a while, but he couldn't keep it because uh, that rhema word that I spoke about earlier raised up in me and I went to the enemy's camp and took back what the devil has stolen. So I don't know what your confidence level is today, but if you need your confidence back, you need to go get it. Do you hear me? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, just go get it. So this powerful prayer tool is thrust forward into the spirit realm against the works of the adversary. It's kind of like throwing a spear. Now, there's still some, uh, someone said, oh no. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. I walked in a restaurant this week and as soon as I walked in the door, I know the people. And the first words that came out of the man's mouth, he said, I'm gonna have a talk with your wife because you don't need to be walking around with sharp pointed objects. So they had live streamed us last week. So anyhow, don't, don't worry, I'm okay. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Hey. Keep your eyes on that spear. <laughs> so that powerful prayer tool is thrusted forward into the spirit realm against the works of the adversary by forcefully hurling this divine instrument into the face of the enemy. You can all tell I don't exercise, all right? But when you hurl your prayer, you are exercising the power of God that he has given you to stop major obstacles from developing in your personal life. The longer the lance, they were used to attack the enemy from a distance. Now the Roman soldiers had all kind of different lances in height, in width, and weight upon the actual spear part. The Roman army used a lance called pilum. Rather than waiting on the enemy to come upon them to their fortified position or in, to their encampment, because if they waited till the enemy got close by, they would be great loss. And I believe there's a lesson there for you and I to learn that we need to start hurling our prayers into the spirit realm before the enemy gets too close so you can kill him at a distance before he gets to your fort of, oh my goodness. Someone give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. So I wanted to have an illustration of how that works. And during a concert that we had a few weeks ago, there was all kind of heavy work going on, unloading a tractor and trailer worth of equipment. And I don't like to stand around and feel like, you know, I'm too good to work. And with my rib situation, I'm not able to at this time. But I'll tell you what I was able to do, and I don't say this to try to bring attention to myself, but I started praying about a week ahead of time, and even that day, while they were unloading everything, hurling my, my lance, my prayer, into the spirit realm because a thousand people were coming that night and we knew hardly any of them that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. God put a hedge of protection around this facility. God, keep your eyes. Have our security at top notch that nothing will go wrong and that is what you do. You don't wait till they show up. You start hurling your prayers into the spirit realm that God will destroy the enemy before he ever gets to your front porch. Give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. So I want you to visualize Paul in prison and he, he's watching the Roman soldiers and probably against the wall they have all these different lances, these different spears for different situations. Paul is imagining the entire range of lances and spears as it comes to the issue of prayer. 
So there he is in prison and he's looking at these different spheres. So now by revelation, he begins to compare the various lances, the various heights, widths, and weights to the various kinds of prayer that God has made available for you, to, you and us, you and us, you and I. Pray with all kinds of prayers. Yeah. You know what he said? All kinds of lances, all kinds of spears, yeah. all kinds of prayer. Ephesians 6 and 18, praying always, note this, with all prayer. In the Greek it would say, with all kinds of prayer. Paul is urging you and I to pick up our final weapon, the weapon of prayer. Now I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures about prayer. Maybe it's just a little rabbit trail. Matthew 7 and 7, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. I, I, I don't think I gave it to the media team. I don't even know if it's on the wall. Philippians 4 and 6, be careful for nothing. Worry about nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Paul is urging us in Ephesians, pick up your weapon of prayer. So the first thing, let's settle, is how often should we pray? Notice what Paul, he begins Ephesians 6 and 18. He says, praying always, always. Now, how in the world are you just gonna always through life get alone with God and pray? It's not what he's talking about. In the Greek, it reads, at every each and every occasion, during each and every opportunity, each and every season of your life, Paul is saying, he's urging you and I, every possible moment. Now let me be honest with you. I feel I pray all the time. I'm talking about when I'm driving down the road I'm praying, honestly, when I'm by myself. When I get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom, something drops in my spirit and I'm praying. When I'm sitting at my office, I'm praying. And I try to start my day off every morning in my place that I go to. I said, I try. And there's times that I struggle with that. Everybody looking at me like, I can't believe my pastor ain't praying more. I didn't say that. Seize every opportunity to pray. You don't have to be on your knees to pray. You can talk to God no matter where you're at. Now I'm gonna say something. Prayer is not optional. But unfortunately, from what I've read and what I've experienced, prayer is the most ignored piece of weaponry. And if we prayed more, we wouldn't need the other weapons. Hmm. Six kinds, somebody say six. Six kinds of prayer for the believer in the New Testament. And now that's what we're gonna learn, okay? So I pray you have a pen and your notebook. Write this down, the prayer of consecration. In the New Testament, the most common word for prayer is taken from the Greek word prosike. I've, I've studied how to pronounce these words. I'm trying. It's the very word that Paul used in Ephesians 6 and 18. The word prosike is a compound of the word pro and ek. The word pros is a preposition that means face to face. To be able to pray. Anthony, face to face. The second part of the word prosike is taken from the word ek in the Greek that describes a wish, a desire, or a vow. V O W. Now, listen to what Webster said about the word vow a solemn promise or pledge. 
An individual would vow to give something of great value to God in exchange for a favorable answer to prayer. Have you ever prayed that kind of prayer? Huh? Have you ever prayed, God, if you'll just make this tumor come back to where it's not cancer, God, I'll be more faithful to church. God, I'll even pay my tithes. Have you ever prayed, God, if you touch my marriage, God, if you bring me out of this financial crunch that I'm in, God, I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that. Be careful. Because he'll answer that prayer. And then you gotta answer your promise. I wanna give you an example out of the Old Testament. Hannah deeply desired a child, but was not able to become pregnant. And out of great desperation, she prayed and made a solemn vow to the Lord. Listen to this in 1 Samuel 1 and 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, let me stop there. I looked that up, Lord of hosts, the almighty Lord who controls all the events of human life. He controls every event in my life and in your life. She said, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. And they, Hannah and her husband, Elkanah, rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son. God heard. God heard and he healed her affliction. God empowered her body to conceive. And I'm sure there's some Hannahs in the house today. Hannah bore a son and called him Samuel, which means God heard. God will hear you. So when you make a vow to God, you better back it up. Do you hear what I'm saying? Many people don't keep that vow. And I'd say I'm probably been guilty at some time or another in my life. Hannah gave her most valued and prized possession to God in response of answering her prayer. So the word prosike tells us that prayer should bring us face to face with God in an intimate relationship. Instead of just, now I lay me down to sleep. Instead of, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need that. In the Greek, it's telling us it should bring us face to face with God in an intimate relationship. So the idea behind prosike is this, come face to face with God and surrender your life in exchange for him consecrating your life. So now I gave you an Old Testament example. Now I'm gonna give you a living example with my friend Rocky. Rocky, stand up and just wave at everybody, would you please? That's Rocky Tietrich. Rocky, you may be seated. Nobody I respect any more than that man. And I called him yesterday to ask if I could share this today. And it's not to elevate him, but it's to give us an example. Rocky was the number one man for Consol. He was the superintendent. He was a young man that, that the, the miners loved to work with. He was a worker. He still is a worker. And he lived in the mines, lived there. Didn't see a lot of his children grow up really the way most of us do. And he said, God, if you'll make a way that I can retire at age 50, I will serve you for the rest of my life, I will work for you. Age 50, Rocky was able to retire. I believe Rocky's 75 right now. I hope I'm right. How old are you, Rocky? 75. How many years have you been going to the nursing home in Hutchison? 
25 years, 50, 75, he made a vow, God, I will serve you. Every Monday night, he goes to the nursing home in Hutchison. He knows all their names. He knows their date of birth. Uh, he takes some birthday presents and Christmas presents. And every Monday night for 25 years, he calls bingo. And, and then he, when they win, he provides uh, the gift, 25 years. He drives veterans. He, I could go on and on and on. He made a vow. God heard and God answered and brought forth what he asked and Rocky has held up that vow and God be the glory. Give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. The second type of prayer is the prayer petition. The second most often used word for prayer in the New Testament is taken from the word D. Esus, the Esus. And it varies forms and translated in its various forms and it's translated prayer and petition more than 40 times in the New Testament, 40 times. Ephesians 6 and 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication. In this verse, the word de Esus is translated as the word supplication. And it describes a need or a want. Have you ever needed something? Have you ever really needed? I'm talking about your basic needs. It is a petition or a cry for God for help. God, I need you. God, I need you. I don't need nobody else, God. God, this is a need that I gotta have. My family needs this, God. And that is a cry of supplication. Jesus prayed this kind of prayer. Hebrews 5 and 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with what? Strong crying and tears unto him, God, that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. You think Jesus didn't fear? You think he wasn't scared? You didn't think he had any stress or pressure? This has got to be talking about in Gethsemane when all the weight of the world was on him and he cried to where his sweat even came down and his tears as blood. This is plainly telling you and I that the Lord Jesus Christ was very aware of the weakness of his humanity. Can I be honest and tell you, everyone in this room, in your humanity, you are weak. I never dreamed I'd be in Ruby Memorial the morning that I woke up of April 10th. But in our natural state, we are weak. And there is times we've got to cry out to God, God, I need you. Jesus did the same thing. Cry out to the Lord. Somebody say amen. This plainly tells us this. Recognizing his need He's in the garden, he, he recognizes his need, but he also recognizes the Father's ability to provide the strength for him in that need. I just wanna tell somebody here today, whatever you're going through, you can recognize uh, your need, but you need to focus more on the ability of God, that God knows your need and God is able to make a way. God can strengthen you to help you through the roughest of storms. Give God a hand clap and a shout of praise. Oh, my, my, my. Psalms 55 and 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. What burden do you have today? Cast your burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He's my creator. He's my provider. But he's also my sustainer. And without him, church, we can't stand through anything shall sustain thee, he shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. The enemy wants you to cry out in discouragement. He wants you to cry out in complaining. Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't mind waiting. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. 
and they shall walk and not faint. Waiting in this context is standing still, expecting that God is going to hear your cry and God is going to strengthen you and make a way. Has God ever made a way for anybody that stood still and waited on the Lord? Give him a hand clap and a shout of prayer. The third prayer, write this down. The prayer of authority. The word I toe, and it's spelled A I T E O. It means I ask or I demand. That doesn't sound real good when you're talking to God, that I demand, instantly I could tell I got on a nerve right there. Someone who prays almost demanding something from God. God, this is what I need. And how can you pray that kind of a prayer? Because you know what you need. And you know that you're not afraid to ask boldly and if you ask boldly, almost demanding, you will receive it. And I pray this gets in your spirit instead of these little weak prayers that we pray, start coming before the throne of God boldly in the name above every other name, Jesus proclaiming what you need and God will hear and answer that prayer. I believe that. The word auto primarily has to do with tangible needs such as food. Shelter, money, and so forth. Some people, I, I don't need no money. Well, you're an idiot. <laughs> Carrie, don't write that in your notes. <laughs> I've had people tell me, I don't care nothing about money. Well, maybe I understand what you're trying to say, but you gotta have it. Amen? So how can one approach God with such frankness? <sighs> Jesus gave us the key to understanding the word auto. Listen to what Jesus said in John 15 and seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. The word ask in this verse is taken from the word auto. This phrase could therefore be translated, you shall demand what you will. Look it up in the Greek. You shall demand what you will. I'm still on some people's nerves. But you gotta keep this demanding in contact with the verse that Jesus wrote. He said, if you abide, and abide means to stay. It means to dwell. It means to lodge, to remain, to indwell, to take up permanent residency. So Jesus knew if his words took up permanent residency in our lives, we would not ask for something or demand something that was out of line. Now, if you get before God and say, I demand a pink Cadillac. <laughs> then you're out of line. But Jesus himself said we can demand it if we abide, if we dwell. If it's permanent, his word is permanent residency in your heart, you will not ask something out of line. So how do we pray? Hebrews 4 and 16, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Turn up your prayer a notch. Speak to God with the authority that he has given you. Amen? Amen. So number four, write it down. Prayer of thanksgiving. This has a special place in my heart. The fourth most common form of prayer in the New Testament is taken from the word eukarista. The word eukarista is a compound of the word you and charista. The word you describes something that is good and something that is well. The word rista is from the word, oh, help me Jesus, K 
prepare us. And that is the word for grace. When compounded together into one word, the new word, e, excuse me, UK Rista, refers to something wonderful, wonderful things that freely flow up out of the heart in response to something. So when Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, he was so overwhelmed with the grace of God, remember the word grace, he was so overwhelmed with the grace of God in their midst that he spoke to them from his heart. In Ephesians 1 and 16, he said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. He's saying, I can't help but thank God for you people. In Colossians 1 and 3, Paul prays the same way for the Colossian church saying, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And here's what has a special place in my heart. Pastor Aaron and I was coming from Fairmont from Kenny and Vicky's house. And I was bragging on Kenny and Vicky. And then I started talking about the church. And I said to him while he was driving, because I was trying to keep my eyes off the road, because he scares me when he drives. <laughs> All kinds of prayers. So he's driving over there, and I'm sitting there praying always. I said, Pastor Aaron, just like this, you realize how blessed we are. how blessed we are with the people in our church. And I made this statement to him and I meant it then and I mean it now. We don't have one troublemaker in our entire thousand plus members of this church. Not one troublemaker. Give God a hand clap and a shout. That don't happen. That don't happen. So I want to say from the bottom of my heart, I thank God for you, for each one of you in this room. Because without you, I wouldn't be who I am today. Furthermore, Paul used the word Eucharista. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, when he tells us, in everything, give thanks. Stand with me. Stay focused, please. Stay with me. In everything, give thanks. What does that mean? It means in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So according to this verse, it is God's will that we use the prayer of thanksgiving in every aspect of our lives in every aspect. Even when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, thank God there's still a tunnel. <laughs> Even when you can't put it all together, you can trust that the Lord will work it out. And you can be thankful that you have him on your side. Because if God be for us, who in the world could be against us? Huh? So, the fifth prayer, prayer of supplication, the word entusis. It carries the idea of one who comes to God in a simple childlike faith. Isn't it amazing how a child bring you a broken toy and say, fix it, daddy. It's what God wants us to have, that childlike faith. A love relationship. Sharing life, life together. We were at, two of the life groups came together out at the Ferris Farm in a one-room schoolhouse from the 1700s or 18, early 1800s. And we had a wonderful evening Friday night. And Mr. Ferris and I, we just kept talking and I was showing him pictures of different things. And he looked at me and he said, everything you've mentioned to me tonight, you mentioned your wife. He said, everything, every trip, everything, your old cars, everything, you like it, you, you do it together. And he said, that meant something to me. 
You know what? It's a face-to-face. Love relationship. How about a kiss, baby? (laughs) All right. God ordained it, okay? (laughs) But I don't only go and get a kiss. We share life together. Don't go just kiss God when you want something from God. Why don't you get face to face with God and have a love relationship with him? That's for somebody that that just dropped out of heaven. It's the only time I kissed her. I don't know how to say this. (laughs) Gun barrel straight. He's one I wanted something. There wouldn't be nothing there. And that's the way it is with God. I bet my kids want to crawl underneath the chair right now. <laughs> Sixth kind of prayer. And we won't be long, I don't think. Prayer of intercession. And I learned some things here. The sixth word for prayer is used in the New Testament. It's taken from the word Hooper Tacano. This Greek word is only found one time in the New Testament. In Romans 8 and 27, or 26, but even there it's not used in connection with believers. It is used in connection with the Holy Spirit. The prayer of intercession. Romans 8 and 26, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It's a work done by the Holy Spirit on our behalf. It's kind of like the example I want to give you if, you if there's a well and the well is very deep and you fall into the well and you can't get out, you need rescued. There's nothing you can do, but you need rescued. And that's the way it is in our life when we fall in a hole and we can't get help and nobody can, can be there the Holy Spirit can intercede for us. It's a work done by the Holy Spirit. I want to say this. It is our responsibility to pray. Nobody else's. We will never be made to pray. Never. It's our responsibility to pray. Note this, that the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. Whatever What is that infirmity? Whatever our particular weakness is, the Holy Spirit will help. It's when you're under so much pressure and there's no possible way. It's in a place where you don't have words. And I have laid in a fetal position before and just groaned and didn't even know what was going on. Groaned. One time the staff in the last couple of years, we were sitting down here and God showed up and I got down on the floor and it just began to groan. That'll happen when you get that face-to-face relationship with God and you don't have no words. The Holy Spirit will intercede for you. So I'll close in saying this, it's when you get lost in the presence of God. Lost in the presence of God. I believe, just personally speaking, that it's been a great seven weeks. But if we don't apply what we have learned, give God the hand, clap of praise. Amen? So I believe we're better dressed for the battle today than we was seven weeks ago. But if you don't apply it, you end up right back in the same old rut. Amen. Amen. And I said this to a couple people. I enjoyed preparing this with the help of a book called Dress to Kill. You can order it. A lot of it came from there. A lot of it came from the commentaries that I use and from the Bible, and from prayer. But I can honestly say I enjoyed preparing it 
more than I did preaching it. Just alone. Just with God. And these things coming from a book, from a revelation, whatever it be. Review your notes from time to time. Stay sharp. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed. All over the room. I want to ask you something. Are you walking through a battle? If you are, raise your hand. My, 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 my. One of the ladies that I really, really respect, I said to her this morning, how you doing? She said, I'm doing okay. I can just sense it. And I said to her, I said, before the end of the service, you're going to be doing better than okay. So all over this room, for whatever reason, we got six prayer examples. Can we use one? (laughs) Is there one out of the six that we could use and just come forward and just say, God, I want to be face to face with you for a moment. All over this building, I'm telling you, he'll strengthen you. He'll strengthen you. Come. Would you come? Would you come? For additional Christ Center content, make sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and check out the Jewel City Podcast.